Walden. In it, the author narrates the two years, two months and two days that he lived in a cabin built by himself, near Lake Walden. With this project of solitary life in the open air, growing his food and writing down his experiences, Thoreau intended several things. On the one hand, to demonstrate that life in nature is the true life of the free man who longs to free himself from the slavery of industrial society. On the other, that the understanding of the resources of nature, its rules, its rewards, are a path that man must not forget. In his asceticism Thoreau longed to transcend his conception of the praise of laziness, reaching a spiritual elevation almost impossible, according to his writings, to be achieved by other means. The defender of behaviorism B. F. Skinner was inspired by this work to give the title to his fictional novel Walden II. Theodore Kaczynski, known as the Unabomber, considers himself a follower of the philosophical doctrine of life in the woods sponsored by Thoreau. In late 1844, Thoreau's friend and mentor Ralph Waldo Emerson purchased land around Walden Pond, located in Concord, Massachusetts, United States, and made it available to him. Thoreau does wish to quietly retire to write, though he is not always alone, many friends, including William Ellery Channing who stayed with him in the fall of 1845 and are often visited by admirers. According to Michel Granger, Thoreau retired to Walden Pond because he sought to disappear momentarily from the life of his native Concord. With his friend Edward Hoare inadvertently set fire to a part of the nearby forest in March 1844. On the other hand, and in addition to this desire to become respectable again, Thoreau's strongest motivation was historical, he wanted to reconstitute his home in the state where it was three centuries ago before the white man's eruption on American soil. However, according to Leo Stoller, it is a profound dislike for the society of men, and particularly for the inhabitants of Concord, which leads Thoreau to deny their busy existence to continue daily subsistence, perverting their desperate freedom. Thoreau's choice is therefore Walden Pond, because it is a place that is neither too remote nor too close to the world of men. In addition, he has known of its existence since his childhood and the pond remains a mysterious place for him. Therefore, he retired to a clearing on one of its banks, an intermediate place, at the same time walled, walled according to his expression, and wide enough to have a protective margin, yet not separated from nature by a barrier. In March 1845, Thoreau began the construction of a pine hut. Its dimensions are 3 by 4.5 meters. It is located on the banks of the pond, 2.4 kilometers from his birthplace. He sleeps in his cabin the night of July 4, 1845, the anniversary of the United States Declaration of Independence in the United States if Thoreau does his best to give an impression of distance from the world of men, it is really nothing, since his cabin he is only a mile from Concord. But this displacement is enough to get him out of the social rut in which he suffers from lack of freedom. It is not then an escape or a hermit life, since Thoreau often returned to see his friends, but from a deliberate choice. This is the beginning of an experiment that lasts two years, two months and two days, carried out in self-sufficiency and during which Thoreau reads, writes, studies nature and grows his own vegetables. He planted a hectare of potatoes, beans, wheat and corn. Thoreau finally leaves his Walden Pond retreat on September 6, 1847. The feeling of having renewed his existence in contact with the natural element has led to a real environmental commitment. After 1850, according to Donald Worcester, paradoxically, he was even closer to nature than Walden. The Thoreau after Walden is more radical and calls for an armed struggle against the American state that justifies slavery. The conclusions reached during his stay at Walden Pond will turn into real social guilt in comments after John Brown's suspension, 1859, than the violence in civil disobedience. The grim parts remain, however, as to the reality of lived experience, but also as to the reasons for his arrival and departure from the pond. During his stay at Walden Pond, Thoreau kept his diary from which he wrote Walden or Life in the Woods. He also began to write A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, a Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, 1849, his first literary success. Walden's writing will take several years, accumulating eight manuscript versions. Thoreau wants to live simply and alone in the woods, however, the authenticity of Thoreau's truly lonely experience has been called into question, I in fact, according to Michelle Granger. The reader may fall into the illusion created by writing, and, believe that T.H. Oro lived in nature as he went to Concord every day to see his friends and that the woods were frequented.
advocates for self-discipline, body and mind. Thoreau refuses to hunt wild animals or consume their meat. Besides being a teetotaler and a follower of vegetarianism, they refuse to smoke, drink tea and coffee. Walden's life is all about a philosophical and mystical adventure, and Thoreau switches between Epicureanism and Stoicism. In this, he is close to the Roman philosopher Musonius Rufus, but also to Goethe or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, according to Pierre Hadot. But Thoreau is not only a contemplative, his activities are mainly focused on observation and understanding of natural phenomena such as the depth or hydrological origin of the pond, or the optical effects of ice, according to the study Fauna and Flora as well. Walden consists of 18 chapters that alternate autobiographical narrative, essay-oriented reflections, poems, and naturalistic description. Thoreau explains the benefits of reading, that of classical literature, preferably in the original Greek or Latin version, and laments the lack of sophistication in Concord, manifested by the excessive importance of popular literature. He aspires to an era, utopian utopia, in which all of New England would support the wise to educate and thereby ennoble the population. Thoreau opens this chapter with a warning against too much emphasis on literature as a means of transcendence. Instead, one needs the experience of life for oneself. Thus, after describing the aesthetics of the landscapes that surround his cabin and his occasional cleaning habits, Thoreau criticizes the whistle of the train that interrupts his reverie. For him, the railway symbolizes the destruction of the pastoral way of life. He then enumerates the audible sounds of his hut, church bells ringing, cows hacking, night jars singing, owls hooting, frogs croaking, and roosters crowing. Thoreau discusses the positive effects of a solitary life close to nature. He likes to be alone, Thoreau said, I have never found a companion as a companion as loneliness explaining that he is never alone as long as he is close to nature. He believes that it is useless to constantly seek contact with the rest of humanity. Thoreau tells us about the people who visit him in his shack. Among the 25 or 30 visitors is a young woodcutter, whom Thoreau idealizes because he is the figure of the ideal man, who leads a simple, quiet and lonely life. It also tells of a runaway slave whom Thoreau helps on his journey to freedom in Canada. Thoreau is focused on growing two and a half acres of beans. He plants them in June and spends his summer mornings weeding the field with a hoe. He sells almost all his harvest and with his small profit covers his needs. Thoreau travels to the small town of Concord every day or so to pick up some gossip, which he finds as refreshing, in its own way, as the rustling of leaves. However, he compares, affectionately, but with some contempt, Concord to a colony of muskrats. He then tells her about an event that took place a few years ago. At the end of the summer, he was arrested for refusing to pay federal taxes, but was released the next day. He explains that he refuses to pay taxes to a government that supports slavery. In the fall, Thoreau walks in the country and writes about the geography of Walden Pond and its neighbors, Flint Pond, or Sandy Pond, White Pond, and Goose Pond. Although Flint Pond is the largest, Thoreau's favorites are Walden Pond and White Pond. They are as beautiful as diamonds, according to him. During a walk in the woods, Thoreau is surprised by a storm and takes refuge in the miserable shack of John Field, a poor Irish worker, who survives there with his wife and children. Thoreau urges him to live a simple but independent life in the woods, thus freeing himself from his employers and creditors. But the Irishman will not give up his dreams of luxury, which are the American dream. Thoreau wonders if it is a good thing to hunt wild animals and eat their meat. He concludes that the primitive, animalistic side of man drives him to kill and eat animals, and that a person who transcends this propensity is superior to those who do not. In addition to being a teetotaler and adept at vegetarianism, he praises chastity and work. Thoreau briefly discusses the many wild animals that are his neighbors in Walden. A description of partridge habits is followed by a fascinating battle between red and black ants. He takes three fighters from his hut and examines them under a microscope. The black ant kills the two little red ones. Later, Thoreau takes his boat and tries to follow a plunge from the pond. After picking berries in the woods, Thoreau builds a fireplace and clads the walls of his cabin to ward off the cold of the approaching winter. There are also good fuel reserves and he is fond of wood and fire. Thoreau tells the story of people who once lived around Walden Pond. He then talks about the few visitors he gets during the winter, a farmer, a woodcutter, and a poet and friend William Ellery Channing. Thoreau enjoys watching wildlife during the winter. He recounts his observations of owls, 
hares, red squirrels, mice, and various birds, and how they hunt, sing, and eat bits and pieces of corn left for them. He also describes hunting the fox that passes by his hut. Thoreau describes Walden Pond as it appears in winter. He claims to have investigated its depths and located an underground exit. He then tells how hundreds of workers came to cut huge blocks of ice from the pond, shipped to different states and countries, so Father Walden's water is pure. When spring comes, Walden and the other ponds melt with crashes and roars. Thoreau likes to watch the ice melt and is ecstatic to witness nature's rebirth. Sea geese resuming their flight north and a hawk playing alone in the sky. As nature seems to be reborn, the narrator does the same. He leaves Walden on September 8, 1847. This last chapter is more passionate than the previous ones. It criticizes the conformity in the following terms. If we don't walk to the beat of our peers, is the reason that we hear a different drum? Let's go according to the music we listen to, no matter how far or far. Therefore, men can find happiness and personal fulfillment. I do not say. I'm not saying that John or Jonathan are aware of all this, such is the character of this morning that the mere lapse of time cannot bring the dawn. The light that breaks into our eyes is darkness to us. Only point in the day when we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is just a morning star is the last sentence of the book. Presented as an authentic and almost spontaneous biographical narrative, Walden is actually a consciously designed book. The archaeology of the text, or the study of the prologue, reveals that Thoreau has moved away from the simple account of his stay in the forest as announced in Economy. The many transformations, additions and deletions reveal the doubts, the multiple possibilities that have been presented, and reveal the contingency that undermines what the narrator wants to present as the work of a unified subject, totally master of his destiny.